example. So say there's a, um, a company and it has a hundred locations. Um, generally what they would do is they'd look at the, the parent and, and that's it. But we were, we were able to, what we were able to do was we were able to not just look at the valuations, the financials, the, uh, So I can't hear you. You're on mute, Manuel. Okay. <laughs> uh, as you're going through that, I'm thinking that almost tip it toe around the PR, which is the risk. Any financial projection is risk versus rewards, right? The two R's of finance. Uh, and uh, going a little bit back to, to materiality and so on, it's very important because what you said, if you reduce by 2%, which is huge, by the way, for a country reduction in carbon footprint, uh, I think, if my memory serves me right, the, the whole electrification of uh, cars will bring the, the carbon footprint by about 5%. So we're talking huge, huge uh, impact. And it's interesting that uh, the first thing, it, it's absolutely necessary to, to put in the factors related to the environment in any project of this size. Second, it's interesting that uh, uh, finance industry doesn't want to talk about the risk from environment. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of there, but they don't consider it a benefit of the project, if I understood correctly what you what you just uh, said. Um, yeah, so, so I didn't mean to say that they didn't care. Um, I'm, I'm sure they do, but it's not the driver of the project. So we don't want to, mm -hmm. no one is making it the driver um, because then like, yeah, like it, it just, it just adds like, it's good to pat yourself on the back after and say, hey, we, we, we reduce emissions by, by a large amount, but it's not, um, um, it's, it's not the driver I find. And a lot of people we talk to, like um, even climate teams, when we talk to them, a lot of their day to day is uh, around, you know, reporting and, and ensuring like um, there's a, you know, like their, their stakeholders are updated on, on either the current state or the progress. Um, but like the finance teams with the investment groups, they, 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 they don't think exactly like that. They're purely making financial decisions. Um, and um, for some funds, they, they are connected and I think they integrate very well. But I think for a lot of the investment firms that we see today, even the ones that we probably think are like they talk a lot about climate and things like that, um, it's not as integrated as, as, as I think their marketing teams make you believe. And, and I think by... Um, by maybe using valuation and value creation as the bridge between finance and climate, I think that, that that's a really, um, I, I think it's a very interesting spot. And I think, um, you know, like a lot of climate people come from maybe environmental backgrounds or engineering backgrounds, and they're not really financially focused. Um, but having them connect their work to financials um, allows other teams to really um, pick up. And, and, I, and I've seen this like, um, one of our uh, pension plan fund clients, they're one of the largest pension plans, sorry, pension plans in the world. Um, their uh, climate team, um, they're amazing because their climate team is not just a climate team. They're actually, um, they, 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 they're, they taught themselves and they've actually gone out of their way to learn the financial modeling. And they go in and they actually apply these uh, and we help them with um modeling the financial benefit for uh for climate initiatives that then all of a sudden now when they're talking to the investment teams it's like the investment teams are seeing the reports in a way that they're generating their own reports so it's it's like everyone's talking the same language and i think in my opinion that's how change happens but it's hard because you still need you know you need to understand like climate science building science you need to understand operations of a company you have to understand the macro um, the environment, you have to understand competitors. Um, there's a lot to know. And I think at this point, I, I firmly believe humans alone cannot do this. You need AI to, to, to help with this. I don't think AI goes like a full like Skynet mode or autonomous and, and starts to just like, like control everything. But I think you, you have the AI operating in a way that humans still are in control, but they're, 
instead of them gathering that information, they're they're reviewing and they're making decisions. And we, we get this all the time. People tell us like, you know, we we turn their teams from like data gatherers into like strategic teams and and and, and strategy setters. So um it's 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 not us. It's really AI that's doing that. And I think I think AI has a huge role to fill. I think it will solve uh, the problems. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, you, you brought sort of a, another angle, which uh, Isabel and I we discuss quite often, which is impact investment and uh, an investment uh, that is done is uh, dual purpose to to return, uh, you know, to uh, return the value of investment, return the principal and interest, and so on. And also, it's uh, it's done with the impact uh, on climate and social. So uh, I, I know Isabella is interested also in that part of the impact investment, right? So yeah, we, we did a really interesting project for um, um, a uh, like an impact fund that was um, they were buying um, the well, sorry, it, it, it was it's still accomplished, but it was uh, they're buying uh, and, and a company based on um, a premise that there is a social impact to it. And um, like one of the things they told us was that we did over six months worth of work in two days. And we charged them like a fraction of, of what everyone else charged them. And the big advisory firms that we were competing with, it wasn't even a, a comp competition because I think we we're operating differently. Um, they would, because they're using humans, they're only able to look at things at a corporate level. They're not looking at it at an individual um, like location level, for example. So say there's a um, a company and it has 100 locations. Um, generally, what they would do is they'd look at the, the parent and, and that's it. But we were, we were able to, what we were able to do was we were able to not just look at the valuations, the financials, the uh, like contracts of, of each individual location, but we we're also looking at how their operations were benefiting the local community. And we're able to uh, break down that community um, specific by um, certain groups. So the specific fund was focused on uh, African Americans, Indigenous, and Latino communities in um, within a certain like um, uh, economic threshold. And like we could model that, and we could see for like all the communities that this fund operate or this this company operates in um, that. You know, like what was each location's benefit in in that community? Did it help? And and we used a very simple metric. I, I I since then I've been meeting a lot of people within the social impact community, and it's very complex to measure. And I I, I get it. Um, our measure was simply um the average uh, household income for those communities, and um we were able to study at a community level, um, like what factors went in previously to like create. A uh, higher like uh, like the increase the the average income in that in those communities, and we were able to use the AI to identify that to then recommend other areas that were lagging. But we're also able to personalize it. One thing I I I think I think we're impact investing or not impact investing, but like um, these like impact initiatives where they fail is I think they try this one size fits all. They're like you know if we open a a gym in every community, everything's going to be good. But there's attributes of the community that 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 are different, and those differences um, make them responsive to different like solutions. And and I think it's very hard to to do this at scale. And I think you need AI to do this. And I, and I really do believe that like um, as long as something bad doesn't happen, um, using AI can actually help to to improve these people's communities, like their their their, their well being by studying specifically them, figuring out what businesses maybe could be subsidized or are helped and supported, and then that creates this like um kind of it's like a fulcrum kind of uh, thing where it 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 creates a larger impact than just simply the, the the initial investment in those communities alone, and and I I think we started with uh, we pitched this to a bank. And uh, they were very happy with with what we suggested. And I think this started within as a sort of a way of um, uh, doing what's called a CRA type work, um, Community Reinvestment Act, for that banks have to do. But I think these banks are starting to see that this is even outside of CRA, this is actually creating new clients for them. This is creating new markets for them. And, and they're not like, at least the people we're talking to, they're seeing um, these initiatives as as like, like just, 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 
a normal business operation eventually. So um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very good. And I think without AI, this is not possible because the human approach, I don't want to say anything bad about another company, but there are companies out there that take money from these banks and these investors, and then just like deploy it indiscriminately. And um, they, I've seen their reports because we've had to assess them. And sometimes they might say, okay, like we, you know, in a community school, we brought in donuts and we taught them how to open a bank account or something. And, and you know, five people showed up, so we're good. But is that really the best way to, to help that specific community? It's like, I, I don't, I don't think so. So it's like, um, I really think AI is going to really, really change this as well. I, I truly believe that AI can is going to help with climate change, help with um, like these social issues, and and just really make things more better and 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 less uh, l less dangerous as it is right now. I feel. Actually, a, a very quick question: CRA, uh, not familiar with. Uh, you mentioned about banks that they have to follow a certain policy. You yeah. Mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I learned a lot about this. So in Canada, CRA is like the uh, Canadian Revenue Agency. So it also has a different word for us. In the United States, I think it's called the it's the Community Reinvestment Act. And um, what? And again, there's people out there who are gonna, you know, they might call me out because they I might be butchering this, but this is my understanding of it. Was um, the governments would have certain areas of uh, like they would mark certain municipalities and say like these are. Um, uh, areas where they won't get, I, I guess, a lot of tax benefit from, like the the appreciation may not be as high. And then what happened, I think in the 40s or 1930s or earlier, um, banks were using this uh, to discriminate and basically say, okay, we're going to take that area. I think they're called like the red areas or something. We're not going to, we're not going to bank in those areas. And then you would get, I think this started in, I think it was in Illinois or Chicago, I, I believe it started, where like, they would, um, yeah, they would use it just to say, like, you know, we're not going to bank in these poor communities. And that's why sometimes if you go into very poor communities, there's no access to banking there and it's hard for them to open bank accounts. So then I think uh, there was uh, some federal agency that basically came out and said, no, 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 we have to do something. So they started to, like, have some kind of, like, CRA score that the banks have. And they need to um, show that they're helping these communities and and certain communities with certain economic, like, um, like thresholds. Uh, and they also, I think they need that in order to work with certain governments. Um, or state governments, and I think they need that whenever there's a big merger. So generally, whenever one bank is buying another bank, they either have to have a good CRA standing, or they have to start like donating a bunch of money indiscriminately to get to their their CRA numbers. Um, so that's kind of where we learned about it. And then, uh, yeah, the group we worked with had to do initiative up around it. And then uh, their head of a certain business was like, "Hey, like, why couldn't we have done deployed this more strategically?" And then that that's how it came on our, our lap. And then we found out that um, there are meetings in Washington and all over um, constantly around CRA. That's a very, very big area. And that's a, um, yeah, it, 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 is a, it is a big initiative. So that, that's my understanding of it. But I think mm -hmm. I heard we, Illinois and others have created their own CRA for like a state level. So um, even like, I think it's going to be more and more important. You, you, you brought uh, actually... Um... The AI is, uh, how can I say, going deep in deep analysis of uh, of a company, of investment portfolio of a company. Uh, but I, I would invite you now to go wide and let's look at the supply chain. And actually, people sometimes confuse value chains and supply chains, which are overlapping but not the same. And I'm, I'm sure when we talk about finance in the value in the uh, supply chains. We, talk actually about value chains. Have you been uh, using AI or seen AI being used in that? And, and sort of to, to, to give a little bit more uh, focus, uh, one of the key reportings right now from the value chains are about carbon footprint. Scope three is coming from, totally coming from value chains. Uh, any, any experience with AI or any thoughts on how AI can be used in those? Um, so our experience might be different than what's going on in the regular world. I just, I only see what I see. Um, uh, one of the first 
projects we get and the easiest projects we can always get are like our customers is like assessing other people's uh, <laughs> um, climate risk. It's um, no one, uh, people would less like to look at themselves as compared to looking at others. So um, we, we do see a lot of companies assessing their suppliers. Um, we see a lot of companies, like a big area for us now is like assessing supplier reports um supplier um like yeah risk um yeah and 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 similarly like 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 who are their mean who are they buying from if we can find that either publicly or they provide private information to, to our customers that we then process but they want to understand yeah like um what could possibly happen either around physical risk or some policy risk that that, that causes a big issue here so this is a this is definitely something a lot of companies are are interested in now, and especially actually in the banking side. I think, um, yes, you could think of supply chains, the physical side of it, like you know, bringing T-shirts and stuff in. But I think when I the way I look at it, at least from a technology perspective, when I when I see it, it's like similar to finance emissions. You're looking at another company that you work with and and trying to figure out what what exposure they have and 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 you know what what risks are they posing and and even from a credit perspective if they you know if 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 you're loaning to a hotel and that hotel gets flooded are you going to see your money back or you know and and a lot of the times like this is a big risk too so um to us when we look at our systems it, it operates very similarly but um we do we do see that as a as a big big point of interest in fact actually today i talked to one of the largest banks around this exact initiative so uh... I'm not sure if I say it correctly, but you seem to be the auditor role. Is <laughs> no, we, I mean, I think, so, okay, this is more, more reflection on me. I, I originally went in and I was like, okay, I'm going to, we're going to show people how to, how to de-risk and move forward and the world moves great. And, 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 and no one really was there yet. We just, we suffered a lot because like the market wasn't where we wanted to be. Um, we have great advisors and and one of uh, my advisors, um, well, I'd love to give a shout out to Dave Carlin from the United Nations. Um, he had a good perspective on how to look at it. He said that I think the first thing is people might just look at the compliance side of it as like, you know, where are they? And they want, might want that audited. The next side, they might want to benchmark and, and compare themselves to their peers. And then lastly, they're going to want to like just, do the best thing and, and beat everyone. So um, I didn't want to believe it when I first heard it because I was like, oh, like, you know, it can't just be a compliance function or you can't just be looking at your peers. This is like something morally we should be doing. But um, he was right. And 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 I think that that is the path. I think we, at least that what I've been seeing is, is aligned to, to his perspective. And um, so part of it, that like part of our work is, is a lot of like climate reviews and reviewing others and, um, yeah, yeah. Like even um, regulators have have reached out to to assess um, investment funds and stuff. So I think everyone wants to understand everyone else's position, and and I think that is um, th it is an area that we've been we've been we've been lucky to to operate in. That's great. And our observation from some research we've done in AKFI is that every company has actually three layers of uh, sustainability, which is very similar to what you're saying, sustainability. The first one is compliance, of course, because that has penalties. And, uh, the second, it's actually more related to maybe uh, internal, uh, internal uh, objectives, internal KPIs for sustainability. This, you know, net zero by 2030, reduce water, uh, eliminate uh, child labor and so on the supply chain. But the third one in the least research, it's actually uh, what they asked the supply chain to help with. And they found even from an informational viewpoint, uh, the structures are not there yet. And what I'm saying is, if you think of the relation between the supplier and the, the customer, it's a contractual uh, relation. So information flows or requirements flow from the customer to the supplier. There is very little information that is required to come back. Now with sustainability, it's almost reversing the, the flow of information. You're asking for a lot of information from the suppliers, as I mentioned, related to sustainability, related to social, related to governance, that A, they are not prepared, and B, they are not ready to share. So, 
and, and I, yeah, I'm sure. but people are actually like, uh, and, and some people are taking it very seriously. One interesting thing is that um, fast fashion company that I, I was mentioning earlier, um, some of their uh, like senior people went to visit the supplier and then they actually, um, they they went to visit them, but they, they actually also were went there to document the machinery that this supplier was using so they can then go back and understand what uh you know what type of emissions are coming from this machinery what kind of like you know like like what's the wear and tear generally or like you know lifespan and and so on and they were not getting that information directly from the supplier it was um a lot of communication issues and at one point they just said they got fed up and they just went and did it themselves so um some companies i do see that urgency that's it's very interesting and it's very very exciting and i think those companies are going to do significantly better than others in the future because they're actually um managing risk um and um like the, and then their overall like uh like basically um existence of their business and ensuring their business is a going concern relative to others who are just sort of like assuming you know because uh, a bridge in baltimore has never gone down it'll never go down in the future so then why do i need to worry about it you know yes me i was thinking uh and and uh actually Isabella is now traveling, I know, and uh, she has a lot of information about AI, more from an ethical uh, and, uh, you know, a different perspective. I don't know if from today's conversation, Isabella, if you picked up any any thread you want to... Yeah, I definitely appreciate uh, Gotham's perspective, uh, his personal outlook on the powerful uh, AI as a tool to expand the human capacity uh, versus when we're start, stuck in the traditional way of thinking and doing things as usual. Uh, AI, I've talked to many people who does share the same value, how AI generates insights that humans are capable of generating. Um, and there's a lot of data out there to provide, to feed this uh, generating system. So I really appreciate this approach in, uh, in empowering human capacity through the AI artificial intelligence. And uh, because of what we do, uh, we, we do come across many professional students who are actively seeking a role or career development in AI artificial development, combining sustainability, because it's hard, kind of hard to separate the both nowadays. You kind of bypass one to talk of the other one. And you've shared a lot of things today, uh, but for those people, what are your particular uh, piece of advice in pursuing a career in such a field? <laughs> I'm the worst person to probably ask that because I um like I'm working with sustainability teams, but I'm like for 20 years I was in like derivatives and risk. Like I um my my skills in financial valuation and um maybe for the last five plus years I've been I've been working on on, on climate and I'm lucky to surround myself with people who have much more uh, deeper experience. Um but yeah, I mean, I'm usually the worst with advice. Like honestly, uh, my girlfriend, <laughs> anyone could tell you, like, don't listen to anything I say. But um, <laughs> let's see it. Let's see. <laughs> tell <laughs> us. <laughs> Even better. No, no, We're never gonna guess. Like never gonna guess. Maybe try to help is uh, was... should the should the younger generation invest in learning about sustainability and uh, in AI? And, yeah, and... I I think. I really believe that like sustainability is value creation. I, I I don't think like like when someone is saying they're doing sustainability, but they're just you know like uh, writing a report that goes and no one looks at it or something. Um, that's not useful. Like I think real sustainability is like understanding the operations of a company and then reimagining how it could be done more efficiently. And that's like a very normal thing we do we should be doing in society where we optimize and make things better um hopefully not like our supply chains where it's like single risk but um i think it's an evolution of, of things so i i would i just i don't know i tell people like find some area that you're passionate about and then just optimize that area like go work and try to make it better and really um like use your imagination but also your technical skills to to improve it and 
like we are entering a very different world than we than at least I grew up in where like there right now even like there's Waymo in San Francisco like there's you could get in a car with no driver uh, this is very likely going to you know impact how goods are transported and you have Amazon with like all these machines um in their factories and and humans who kind of just manage the machines or do like <coughs> like uh, outlier tasks and like like this is a world that we're going with and i think like i don't know like just I think people should be aware of all these changes and then try to figure out how they can make their own operations better and and and, and improve the world. And I think a byproduct of that will be that they will reduce the carbon emissions. I, I I see this all the time. I think even like some of the most like 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 admired chief sustainability officers at at different private equity funds and different funds that I I meet, um, they're they're indistinguishable from the investment team they're really they're very they they understand the operations they they, they, they talk the talk they, they they understand and and they're trying to solve those problems they're not trying to like you know it's it's not about like you know the the latest reporting standard or something those are like most investors don't even know that like uh, you can go to many investors who i talk to and ask them what tcfd is and they actually don't know it's not something they care about right so but if you can actually talk their talk you can you can make change so i, I just say like whatever people work in, whatever they're happy doing, whatever they enjoy. Um, just, yeah, try to figure out how to maybe use, uh, how to do things a little more efficiently and and sustainably. And 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 I think AI can help you and, and use whatever tools, like maybe AI um, hits its limit and there's a new tool in the future. And we have to just always be open to to using whatever we have available to to, to just just make a dent every day in in our emissions and and I think and, 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 and making the world a better place for people. Like, like you can hit all the ESG metrics, so. It's just it's just like one step at a time. It doesn't have to be like, you know, you don't have to solve all the biggest problems on day one. I, I think it's people put a lot of stress on themselves. And I see, especially in sustainability, a lot of folks I talk to that like they're more stressed than they should be. And and it doesn't help anyone. Sorry, that was probably not the answer anyone wanted. I, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, thank you for the uh, worst piece of advice to our <laughs> audience and professionals out there which is uh, a lot of uh, takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam, for everything today. And thank you for taking the time. Uh, and thank you to our audience as well for tuning in. Make sure to join us every week for a new episode of AKFI's actionable ESG talk series, where you can gain new perspective on how to mitigate risk and create a value by integrating ESG and digital transformation. Until next week, bye for now. Bye, Manuel. Bye, Gautam. Bye. Bye, Gautam. Bye.